Welcome to worship at Middleton Community Church, where we say no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today's scripture is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. God is still speaking. Let us listen. God bless you. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching him, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, Alphaeus' son, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, James' son. All were united in their devotion to prayer, along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The story we are about to hear is the evolution of a midrash, the ancient Jewish art of expounding on scripture, of talking it out, filling in the gaps of what is between the words, taking it to its conclusion as a way to find meaning through conversation. The Gospels tell us in a few different ways the story of the ascension of Jesus, the story of his rising, to higher ground. The story even spills from the Gospels into the book of Acts. Perhaps the details are a little muddy, so let us refresh your memory. Now, I don't know that this is exactly how this story happened, but I do know that this story is true. After Jesus died, he began appearing to his friends. Generally, this happened when people, his friends, would gather together and start sharing stories about Jesus, retelling his jokes and ha- talking about the things that they had done together, the lessons that Jesus had taught. On this particular day, a really large group of people had gathered together, and Jesus showed up. He began to teach them things like resist, pray for your enemies, turn the other cheek, go that extra mile, and of course, love one another. Every single other. When he had said all this, a voice from the heaven boomed, ascend. And so he did. He spread out his arms and he smiled as he looked up to heaven and he started to rise. Slowly, He began to be lifted off the ground. The disciples watched and they didn't know what was happening. And then Mary, seeing what was going on, 
shouted out and took a running start and leapt and grabbed hold of Jesus' ankle. I'm coming too, she said. And John, not to be left out, John, takes his own leap of faith and grabs the other ankle. Now Jesus, on his way up, is slightly concerned that Mary and John are hanging there, and he looks back up to heaven and says, God, what do I do? And God says, And so all together, holding on to one another, lifting each other up, they all together began to rise. Now other disciples, seeing Mary and John rising with Jesus, they wanted to go too. So suddenly, all of Jesus' friends are jumping and grabbing onto ankles, and Mary and John and Jesus are reaching down and pulling them up, and you get this small pyramid of people swaying in the breeze swinging together from the sky, and Jesus is overwhelmed and looks again up to the sky and asks, what do I do? And God says, all together, holding on to one another, lifting each other up, they all begin to rise. And then people from all over, folks who had seen Jesus' miracles or heard him preach, people who had seen Jesus' friends uh, feed the, the crowds or had heard about it, all of these people had who had anyone who had been shown a kindness began to jump and grab and join this mass moving upward towards God. And then one little girl at the bottom shouted, Stop! Wait! I need to bring my dog! But the dog was far away, across a field, and Jesus, way up at the top, yells back down, think fast, I really don't know how this works. So the little girl, still scanning the horizon, reaches out and grabs what is available, the branch of a tree, and she hangs on tight. And God says once, Again, ascend. Everyone continues to rise. Everyone is lifted, and the tree begins to rise too. And at the point it looked like the tree was going to be uprooted, the tree dug in its toes and held on tight to the earth. And the earth, grabbed hold of the water, and the water held on with its waves, and no one let go, and slowly all were rising together. All were holding on in love with one another. All were being lifted together up, and the whole world was drawn closer to God. Again, I am not sure it happened exactly this way, but I do know that this story is true. As the moon Pulls the ocean, so my soul is drawn to you. Pull me closer as you circle, I will fall and rise with you, and rise with you. As 
the tide rocks the beaches, lifting sand as it rolls through. Lift us up into your dancing. We will rise and dance with you. Thank you to Laura, Laura for retelling that story for us and to Valerie for reading it. Here now, uh, this poem, Ascension Day, from Meta Herrick Carlson's book, Speak It Plain. It could have been a magic trick, a one-man show. Now you see me, now you don't. But this rising has been a gift for whole, the whole of creation. We have put our fingers in his scars and felt the breath of peace. We have recognized him calling our name, and in the breaking of bread, he joined us on the road and cooked breakfast on the fire. Our senses know something has changed, and it will not be kept in isolation. So when he gives us to each other, when he goes to prepare a place for us, there is a good reason to hope that we will all be together in paradise. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. I wanted us to hear that story twice today because I don't think um, the ascension is one that we hear often. It is not uh, a scripture that comes up often in our churches, and there is so much beauty and wisdom in this image of God and the people arising. But I want to take a step back uh, to those two uh, who joined the disciples at Jesus' ascension those two figures who showed up looking quizzically at the disciples. Why are you standing here looking toward heaven? You've probably heard the uh, modern fable or read it in a chain email somewhere of a man uh, stuck on a roof during a flood. And as the waters begin to rise, this very faithful man bows his head in prayer and asks God earnestly to send help. Soon, a woman in a rowboat arrives and offers him a ride to, safely, to safety. No, thank you, the man says. 
I'm praying and I know that God is going to save me. A couple hours later, a neighbor on a jet ski comes by his house looking for stranded survivors, and the very faithful man on his roof says, oh, no, 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 no. Go help somebody else. I've been praying, and I know that God is going to save me. And so the jet ski leaves. Then a helicopter arrives, and it lowers that big swinging ladder, right, that we've seen, and a member of the Coast Guard climbs down the ladder and comes near the house, and through the wind and the rain, the man yells again, no, 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 I'm okay, you go on, you have more important work to do, I've talked to God, and God is going to save me. The helicopter leaves, and no one else comes. The man drowns and meets God at the pearly gate. He is distraught. God, I have been so faithful. I prayed, why didn't you save me? I prayed and prayed and prayed, and you did not answer. And we know how this ends. God looks at him and says, oh, love. That's what God addresses people as, oh, love. But I did answer. I sent you a boat and a jet ski and a helicopter. I sent you three neighbors, but you turned me away each time. This story is a little too on the nose for my liking, Uh, but it makes a good point. Too often, people of faith look to heaven when in reality, God has given us each other. Why are you standing there looking toward heaven, the angel asks, when you should be out there looking at each other? Now, Ascension Day might be the last standing Christian holiday to not be touched by capitalist consumer culture, right? Uh, You're not going to be able to go out and buy an Ascension Day card at the grocery store. Um, And you could imagine, and this is why I'm surprised, because you could imagine what a popularized Ascension Day could do for the balloon industry, (laughs) right? Think about it. It's a billion-dollar idea. Somebody needs to go market it. Uh, (laughs) Technically, on the Christian calendar, Ascension Day actually fell last Thursday. So it happens uh, 40 days after Easter, the 40th day of Easter. Uh, And it is uh, the end of this time that Jesus spends post-resurrection, right? For weeks, we've been hearing these stories of Jesus showing up to the disciples after the resurrection, coming through uh, uh, walls, ignoring locked doors, joining them on the road to Emmaus, calling to them from the lake shore. He ate with them. He picked up bread, blessed it, broke it, shared it with them, and they believed. They came to understand that all the pain they had suffered watching him be arrested and tortured, humiliated and killed, all of it would come to some greater purpose. All of it led to this resurrected Christ who is there with them now. All of it led to this moment, to a hero who they could touch, someone who would finally rescue them. Or maybe he wouldn't. So maybe the disciples still don't get it. Uh, You might notice that this is a theme in the life of the disciples, a defining characteristic, if you will, that they get it, but they don't quite get it. At the moment of the ascension, the disciples ask Jesus if finally, finally, he is going to return Israel to them. That is, if he is going to overthrow the Roman Empire and return the land to God's people. And Jesus responds in an oh-so-frustratingly characteristic Jesus way, don't worry about that. It's not for you to worry about. You stay, he says. You wait here, and the power of the Holy Spirit will be with you. And you will be witnesses to this power, in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
That is, Jesus tells his disciples once again that his power, his mission, is about so much more than military might. It is about so much more than overthrowing governments or unseating rulers. It is about turning the world completely upside down. The love of God is alive in this world, is so far beyond what we can imagine, and time and again the disciples are held back by the shortcomings of their own visions. And so once again, Jesus points them to one another, draws them into community, and sends them out into the, to love the world. Why are you standing here? The two figures say, looking toward heaven. It's really interesting, the wording that Jesus use here, uses here in his commissioning for the disciples at the Ascension He tells them that they are to be witnesses to the love of God in four places. First, here in the city of Jerusalem, this giant city that they're visiting, until the Holy Spirit shows up. And then he says, you're going to share it with all of Judea. That is their home, right? They are from the countrysides of Judea. And they're going to go out and they're going to tell all their neighbors and be witnesses to God's love in their own communities. It is a place that is familiar and safe. But Jesus doesn't stop there because he says they will be witnesses to this love in all of Samaria. Remember Samaria? The place where they are despised and the place that despises them. And there too, they will be witnesses to God's love. And then Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus says, you will be witnesses to God's love to the very ends of the earth. Now, for the disciples, that was probably like Spain, right? To the very ends of the earth. If Jesus is the stone dropped into still water, he makes it very clear that these disciples, his friends, this church, is to be the ripple that goes out and changes everything. For the disciples, uh, that wasn't very far. And I imagine that in our globalized context, it might not be that far either, right? It's easy for us to fly to Spain, relatively so. But what, who do you feel most divided from, most disconnected from? Who do you have the hardest time imagining as part of the beloved community of God? Whose relationship with you feels like the very end of the earth? And can you be a witness to God's love in their lives? Why are you standing here looking toward heaven? They ask the disciples as they stand dumbfounded by the sight of Jesus being drawn upward, leaving them in his dust. When you should be out there, working toward one another. I wonder if the resurrected Christ stood before me today, what would I say? What question would I ask him? I imagine I might quote the Psalms. How long, O Lord? How long must we wait for justice on earth? How long must we wait for the hungry to be fed, for wars to cease, for children to know that they are safe in their homes and in the halls of their school? How long must we wait for queer folks to be included in every single beloved community? How long must we wait to have our dignity and worth and value affirmed by God's people? How long must we wait for violence and anger to fall away? How long until you step in on this global climate crisis because we're not doing so great? How long, O oh God, until you take back the creation you claim to love? And reading this story today, I can imagine Jesus' response to my how long might be something like, as long as you are willing to wait. Why are you standing here looking toward heaven when you should be out there looking for one another? 
I'm not sure the disciples were at all comforted by this. I'm not sure that I am. By Jesus once again ignoring their cries for an extreme political movement, if the vision Jesus showed them is left in their bumbling hands, what hope do they have? If this vision is left in our hands, what hope do we have? The Australian theologian William Loder observes that it is a rather cruel thought, a bitter disappointment, that all that has become of Jesus' vision is the church. All that has become of Jesus' vision is us. What good news to the poor is that? He asks. What right have we to masquerade as the kingdom of God in a world where the people of Galilee on every continent still cry out, How long, O Lord? It's a challenging question to ponder, and the good news is that we know that the story doesn't end here, and that Jesus does not leave the disciples alone. As promised, next week we will hear the story of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, joining the early church in those first days giving them the strength and the compassion and the wisdom and the fire to respond to a hurting world right there in front of them. And as we read on in Acts, we hear the results of this power, the earliest churches being hyper-local, tight-knit, beloved communities where the well-being of each member mattered, where resources were pooled and the poor and the sick honored and love shared at every single table. Why are you standing here looking toward heaven, the angels asked, when you should be out there serving one another? Our senses know something has changed, and it will not be kept in isolation. So when he gives us to each other, when he goes to prepare a place for us, there is good reason to hope. We will all be together in paradise. Amen. We have a few announcements for the life of the church. You'll find them all in your bulletins if you have one of those, but let me highlight a couple of them. First, today is Undie Sunday, so hopefully you brought your underwear, new ones in a package. Uh, there is a table out in Fellowship Hall uh, where you can leave those. It will um, still be here this afternoon if you're coming back for women's tea and you forgot them, you can bring them. Uh, and all of that uh, will go um, to Middleton Outreach Ministry, which is no longer called Middleton Outreach Ministry, but let me get way forward resources, way forward resources, which we are thrilled for them uh, in this new iteration, but uh, that slide is wrong. So bring that and we will get it to them. Uh, and then that's your reminder that if you signed up to attend the women's tea this afternoon from one to three, it looks like it's going to be a great time. Come. If you have a wonderful hat to wear, I encourage you to wear a wonderful hat. <laughs> Uh, sign up for our next Healing House meal. It's set up on the missions, mission table. Um, we provide meals regularly uh, to the Healing House, which provides uh, safe uh, home health services for homeless families when somebody is recuperating from uh, surgery or a hospitalization. So if you can contribute to that meal, the sign up is out in the mission uh, room, and that meal will be on June 25th. Finally, one of the many wonderful things that Darcy did that w fell very far outside of her job description was to keep up our free little pantry, which is located at the end of the drive and gets a lot of use. We're looking for a new uh, manager of the free little pantry. It's easy. We have lots of donations. It's a matter of somebody who can check on the pantry uh, regularly to keep it stocked and monitor the inventory that we have. If that is a job that you are interested in and you're somebody who drives past the church a lot and could stop and look at it, uh, let the office know, or me, or Kristen Friel, who is the chair of our uh, uh, board of uh, mission and stewardship. That would be appreciated. And finally, next week, we'll be collecting a special offering, one of our five special UCC offerings, Strengthen 
the church. Strengthen the church helps to support the work of the conference and the national church um, as we become a multiracial, multicultural church. So this, uh, these monies are used for new church starts and to support churches in places that are often underserved by the UCC. Uh, so just know that that offering will be next week. I think that's it. Uh, so a continued thank you to everybody who financially supports uh, Middleton Community United Church of Christ. You can give online by going to middletonucc.org, or you can give, and this is new, so pay attention. Uh, the plates are not in uh, the, just outside the doors. We've installed boxes because we're not going to go back to passing plates through san the sanctuary. So we've installed some, bo some boxes on the wall just outside the door where you can put offering. And then our counters won't feel so nervous standing out there with the plates when everybody's uh, uh, moving around. Uh, so just so no, know that those uh, offering boxes are right outside the doors. All right, let us stand and sing together. <laughs> Whatever is true, whatever is kind, whatever is noble, keep this in mind. Know you are hell, God's love keeps you close. No matter what, know you are loved wherever you go. Open your Whatever is true, whatever is kind, whatever is noble, keep this in mind. Know you are hell, God love keeps you close. No matter what, know you are loved wherever you go. Open your heart. So the sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God, inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only for us, but also for our children. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ church, a sign to the seal and seal of their participation in the way of God and the beginning of their growth into full faith and discipleship. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation, called forth by your saving word. Before the world that had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters, and out of the waters of the deep you formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with the waters of the flood, and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. In the time of Moses, your people, Israel, passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the promised land. In the fullness of time, you sent our brother Jesus, who was nurtured in the waters of Mary's womb. Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of the disciples, and sent them forth to baptize all people by water and the Holy Spirit. Be with us now in this moment as we baptize Lucy and welcome her into this story, into our story, into your story of love. Amen. 
Megan and Caleb, do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, we do. We do. Will you encourage her to renounce the powers of evil and to live in the way of love and justice? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. Will you teach her to follow in the way of Jesus? If so, say, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. And will you join with this congregation in sharing your own faith with her? Will you encourage her by your words and actions and walk with her in her own faith journey? If so, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. And Tara and Michael, recognizing that many persons nurture and influence the life of a child, Will you support Lucy and her parents as they all grow in faith? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. And now it's your turn. <laughs> Beloved, do you commit yourselves to support and nurture this child within a community which worships God, loves and serves others, seeks justice and resists evil? We do by the grace of God. All right. You ready? Yeah, oh, you're ready. You're ready. <laughs> By what name shall we call this child? Just tell me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. Lucy Mary Ziegler, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who is one God and mother to us all. You are so loved. And now we are going to welcome Lucy into the family of faith. You'll notice there's a typo in your bulletin, so please don't call her Brooklyn. Call her Lucy. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll invite you to sit down, and I'll bring her back to you, okay? Yeah. Oh, do you see the water? Look at that. Let us welcome Lucy. Into the household of faith, we welcome Lucy with joy and thanksgiving. We are members of the body of Christ. We are inheritors of God's promise. In the spirit of love, we welcome you. Yes. All right, so we're going to sing, and I invite you all to go back to Sunday school, and I'm going to introduce Lucy to the congregation, and then I'll bring her back, okay? One more dip. There we go. Yeah, she likes the water, doesn't she? <laughs> Let's sing together. Let's sing together. 